afternoon or good morning yet, I guess, ITS Georgia. Um, I think we're all set up and ready to go here. If you're still getting hooked in, we're just getting going on a training session. The first of three training sessions that we'll hold in the month of December, uh, one per week. And um, my name is Mark Start. I'm on the board of ITS Georgia. Happy to moderate today as we talk about uh, various uh, ways that we can use data to improve TMC operations. As I said, this is the first of a, a series. Uh, we'll have uh, additional series, uh, parts of the series uh, in next week and the following week. So be looking out for the email blasts uh, related to that. Um, I'm going to do a quick introduction of the topic today, and then we're going to get into our speakers. And uh, thank you again very much for, for tuning in. Um, as we look at the topic of TMCs and data, you know, TMCs are the places where a lot of data is generated and the place where a lot of data is consumed. And so we're very aware that this is um, a place where you can get data overload. And um, in the world of operations, generally you don't have a lot of time to get your calculator out and uh, figure out what's going on on the roadway. You need a tool that helps you uh, be informed about what you need to do next. So the TMC environment is uh, an interesting one from that respect in that we need to be able to um, act quickly and to um, use data effectively. So as we look at this topic um, and what are the goals for, for this training, we want to provide you today with a number of snapshots about how data is being used in TMCs uh, in practical ways, uh, recognizing that the amount of data is large. Uh, we wanna offer some ideas for how to incorporate tools so that the, the data can be uh, managed well. Uh, we wanna demonstrate a couple platforms that have emerged that we think are particularly useful for this environment. And then also provide a few tips for what you can do today in order to improve your use of data. So that's kind of what we were uh, coming from with respect to putting up this session. And um, as I've uh, been working in Atlanta, I've also been working with a number of folks around um, the AECOM uh, company where we have many people working in transportation management centers, including where we are here in Atlanta, of course, as well. Um, and so I asked a number of folks to bring to the table what are the really good things that are happening in their center with respect to data analysis, uh, data usage, new uses of data. And so uh, these are today's speakers, which I'll quickly uh, introduce. First of all, we have Chrissy Kohus, who's working at the Transportation Management Center in, in Indianapolis, and she's been doing that for some time, um, very, uh, very embedded in the center there. Uh, also, Paul Ahrens, who's in our Michigan offices, and he is supporting a number of TMCs uh, that are uh, under the purview of the Michigan Department of Transportation. And then thirdly, uh, Don Avery, who's located in Miami, and we're all a little jealous today, Don, of you in Miami, uh, given it's cold out there, but uh, we, we uh, assume you're not going to flaunt that too much with your presentation. Don's been working with FDOT District 6 for the better part of the last decade um, at, at the Sun Guy TMC. And then finally, uh, we have Katherine Johnson, who's with us here in Atlanta. And she has recently taken the role of the operations quality manager for the TMC here in Atlanta. So these are the folks that are going to be giving us um, some of their experience at TMCs. And we're gonna do it in sort of two phases. At first here in the first hour of this session, we're going to give you 15 minute snapshots of four different data and tool opportunities uh, from other TMCs 
And hopefully that's useful as we just think about what we're doing here in Georgia. And then for the last 45 minutes, we're going to look at some applications that you can set up today, uh, assuming you've got a RITUS account. Um, these are things that Katherine Johnson will give us um, uh, a walkthrough. And if you don't have RITUS, um, it's not too late. I believe the email blast gave some instructions on how to sign up. Um, and we think these things are, are pretty universal and things that you can employ uh, quickly if you haven't already done so. So that's the, the lineup for today. And again, thank you for joining. If you've come in a little late, my name is Mark Start. Um, and today we're gonna to be looking at a panel of folks that work at TMCs, um, in this case in, in Indiana, Michigan and Florida, as well as Georgia, to talk about what kind of data and what type of tools that help us manage the data are emerging and what might be of use to you and your operation um, if, if these topics are in fact what you're doing. And as you can see, we're covering things from work zones to corridor performance, uh, freeway service patrol monitoring and first responders. So we're hoping that this type of broad section of topics uh, covers you somehow, some way. And um, we're looking forward to the discussion that follows. So in a minute, I'm gonna hand it over to Chrissy, who's gonna start us off. Um, generally speaking, um, we'd want you to put questions that you have in the chat and we will get to see those uh, within a little bit of time um, after you put them in the chat. And if it's a, a, a mission critical question that helps the, with the context of where things are in the presentation, we'll probably answer it right away. Otherwise, I think we're gonna let the questions queue up and we may even wait until all four of the snapshot presentations conclude before we start answering those questions. So we'll kind of see how it goes, but uh, please put your questions in the chat as you go and uh, we'll see how this, uh, this shakes out. So Chrissy, um, if I can ask you to uh, begin broadcasting and thank you very much for coming on board today. And, and Chrissy's gonna talk about uh, probe data utilization in work zones. Thanks, Mark. Uh, my name is Chrissy Coase, and I'm with the uh, Indiana TMC. The program we're going to be looking at today is called Jam Logic. Uh, Jam Logic was created because NDOT started a 60 mile work zone project um, from the east side of Indianapolis to the Ohio state line. Um, within that 60 mile work zone projects, there's multiple projects within the project, um, both eastbound and westbound. Um, so with that being said, the operators here at the TMC, we put in DMS messages, but we don't make custom DMS messages. So with winter coming and all that stuff, um, they decided to make a program that would send automatic messages to the message boards for the public to read. Um, so what Jam Logic is made of, it, it's got 150 sensors and those are eastbound and westbound and they're one mile apart from each other. Um, those sensors are radars and they have um, their solar power with battery backup. Um, and then it sends cellular to the cloud and then it's vendor managed. Um, along with the sensors, there's 69 message boards. Um, 53 of them are on the interstate and 16 of them are on the, um, the side roads to tell the public what they're getting into with queuing and stuff with the work zone queuing. Um, this, what you're seeing here is jam logic. So this is the, sen I'll zoom in in a second too. So these are the sensors that are mile apart. Um, as you zoom in, you're able to see, you're able to click on each sensor and over here to your left, You'll see it, unfortunately today, everything's running great too, by the way. So we're not gonna see any major backups or anything like that. Um, so it's telling you 70 eastbound with the mile marker, um, everything's running fine, 62 miles an hour. People are speeding through the work zone. Um, with a lot of these sensors, you'll see a few faulty sensors. So this would be a faulty sensor right here. And what tells you it's faulty is 
you won't see a message sign and I'll get into the message signs in a second. So actually with the message boards, the automatic messaging that goes to the uh, public is if there's no queuing within 15, mile, 15 miles, it'll stay in one phase and it'll tell the public um, a travel time sign. Um, if there starts to be queuing within 15 and eight miles with speeds of 45 to 31 miles an hour, it'll go into a two phase cycle. Um, it'll say traffic slowing X miles. And then it'll also have a travel, si travel time sign in the second phase. Now, if speeds are less than 30 miles an hour, it'll tell you slow traffic at X miles and the travel time sign as well. Um, so when you get into your more um, advanced queues for the work zone, um, eight to three miles, it's, it has the uh, two phase also. What you'll see is um, traffic slowing again, X miles, slow traffic X miles, but the message board will start flashing too. So, so the public can see, hey, I should maybe read the DMS board that I'm looking at. Um, so the flashing condition happens. And if it's under 30 miles an hour, between eight and three miles, it'll say prepare to stop at a certain um, mile. Now, when you get to three miles or less, uh, your phase one is gonna say slow traffic ahead. The message boards are gonna flash. Um, and if it's the 31 to 45 miles an hour, it'll say prepare to stop. Same thing for the under 30 miles an hour. So we're telling the public prepare to stop. Um, now on the side message boards, what we'll see is, let me scroll over. So when you see a travel time sign, you know everything's okay, even though you see some yellow sensors and it might appear that traffic is slowing, that's showing we have a faulty sensor there. Um, but if you see that there is a travel time sign um, and you know the distance between it's talking, you can see that everything's all right. Um, for the traffic entering the interstate, if um, everything's okay, the message board will go into two phases. One phase showing westbound traffic, travel time sign, one phase showing eastbound traffic, travel time sign. Um, same thing, parameters, if there is traffic queuing, it'll go into the same phase as we just saw. Another good thing about this is Ohio let us put the sensors and the boards all the way into Dayton for westbound traffic. So it doesn't stop at the um, Ohio state line. It actually goes into Dayton, Ohio to tell people coming into Indiana um, what's going on with the work zones. Um, eastbound, it only goes over here to right into here. So um, zooming out on this program, it's kind of clunky because you got a bunch of sensors um, piling up. So it looks like right now there's a bunch of problems when there's really not, you can, zo you can zoom in and see that there's not problems. Um, the good thing about this is um, it took a lot of burden off the operators. Um, this 60 mile work zone project in both directions, um, obviously there's a lot of queuing for construction. It's a busy area. Like I said, today there's no, no major problems, but um, instead of the operators having to constantly monitor it, constantly throw in messages and um, the vendor does it for us and it takes a lot of burdens off the operator. Um, I think I think that's about it for this one. So Chrissy, as you're um, you know continuing to monitor the system, this is probably a multi-year construction project. Is is this like the big construction project for the state of Indiana, and therefore this seemed to be the best way to relieve some of the burden from operators? Uh, yes, it started out. Um, they asked if the operators could start using custom messaging and um, NDOT is pretty against the custom messaging for uh, releasing it to the operators. Uh, so far this project has been, it's been a four month project and it's going into the winter. And like I said, it's both directions. Um, with, this, with the DMS 
um, messages that operators do put in here. It's a standardized eight question. So anytime we would see a backup or if there was a crash or anything, the message is pretty, it, it's a good message, but it's vague. It would say all lanes slow, close to so-and-so. But now this way, the public can decide if they either, either want to even get on the interstate at all through the side road DMSs or if they need to exit um, because work zone queuing, you know, can, when you're down to one lane and you have a crash, so all lanes are blocked, you know. Um, so it, it has been a great tool to utilize for the operators and it shows historic data for the, um, for the NDOT higher ups to see where their problem spots are. They can always go back and look. Another thing this has done is uh, after they created uh, Jam Logic, they started um, a new program called Purdue Heat Map. So Purdue was able to um, bounce off this program and come up with a, an awesome program where um, it, it monitors the hard braking and, um, and it uses OnStar even if you don't have OnStar, but um, the, it'll automatically take pictures of when there was hard braking of the three closest cameras to um, wherever the hard braking was. So, and that's historic too. So it's, it's became a great tool. Have you heard about public feedback? Cause this is kind of an, in, this is fairly intense compared to your, or, or there probably wasn't much ITS infrastructure well outside the, the metro area. What's the public saying about this? So I don't know exactly what the public's saying, but through trial and error, when this first started, there was a lot of backups. There was a lot of um, queuing in these work zones and crashes. Since we've started this program and the DMS has been available on the side roads, we haven't had as much. And I think maybe that's because they've decided not to get on the interstate when something's wrong, or if there's even a queue due to a work zone, there, it could be no crashes, but work zone queue. Um, so I don't know exactly the public feedback, but from working here long enough, I think it's done good for the public. Fantastic. Very good. I don't see any questions in the chat, so I think we're probably going to move on unless I see any questions come up real quick here. Otherwise, Chrissy, uh, thank you very much. Um, we are, you know, we're definitely aware of the pain of large construction work zones. And uh, thanks so much. Is there anything else you want to add or shall we move on? Uh, we are going to um, put this in other work zones now too. This was a trial. Um, we got a, we have major work zones on 65 from Indianapolis to uh, Gary, Indiana or the Northwest region. So um, they're going to expand it. it. It's been working well. Very good. Thanks again, Chrissy. Thank you. So that's snapshot number one. Now we're going to move to um, uh, what the uh, Michigan TMC offices have been working on and that's related to looking at corridor performance. And I'm gonna hand it off to Paul Ahrens. Paul. Thanks, Mark. Um, yep, I am um, I set up in Michigan and I am supporting all of our Michigan TOCs here on the engineering and analysis side. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, corridor analysis and reporting tool that we've been developing. So real quick, what is it? It's an interactive dashboard that connects various data sets um, to assist the analytics, either you know engineers, operators, managers. Um, it's very easily expandable. We have it set up so um, it ingests crashes, construction, special events. However, we know that there's additional data sets out there that we want to get our hands on and get integrated into this program, meaning you know, weather, CAD data, things like that. Um, this is set up to be accessible by AECOM and the Michigan DOT. Um, it's an online tool. All you need is a, a link and a password to get in. And um, whoever the Michigan DOT decides to share that with, they can have access. So future expansion they're looking at sharing this access with some of their um, local stakeholders and other partners. Um, I will start off with a caveat that this is still a little bit beta. Um, capabilities, data sets, and everything else continue to be added, but we're really excited where this is going to go. 
sorry, slide got stuck. So uh, why did we need this tool? Well, we wanted to maximize the, um, the use of our existing data, you know, easily be able to ingest and overlay different data sets, store it all in one location. So that way we're not you know, doing downloads and, and matching, trying to match Excel spreadsheets and timestamps and all that stuff from various places and reporting periods. Um, we wanted to be able to easily verify the data quality as it came in before it was loaded to that tool and also provide a single access point for the end users to be able to overlay whatever data sets they wanted to look at and include over timeframes, timestamps, that kind of thing. Um, overall, it supports our freeway operations program. Um, I know there's a lot of corridor analytics out there with different platforms. This one's geared specifically at this time anyways, to look at our freeway operations, uh, both on a, on a corridor level and a segment level. And those are all uh, easily selected by the user. Um, the goal is to get this to real-time operations, to get this in the hands of the, on the floor with the operators to be able to make those real-time decisions, um, and also support planning and future decision-making for construction projects, traffic incidents, things like that. So, you know, we know there's tons of data available at our TMCs, right? But, you know, many of those data sets are isolated from each other, and they require significant manipulation to be able to compare those different data sets. You know, I guess breaking down the silos is sort of cliche. Uh, and we all know it's kind of difficult to do with people, right? But it's really easy to do with data. Um, by nature, though, you know, the individual data sets that the TMCs can get in, get a hold of, like roadside sensors, third party probe data, um, they're all captured in their own platforms, right? Their own proprietary platforms. And here's your user interface for this data set. And that's pretty much it. Um, in order to get the most out of all of the data that's coming into the TMCs, we need to find a way to simultaneously connect and overlay all of those data sets, um, you know, connect those different silos for the end user. Um, so, you know, we're also trying to set this up where, like I said, additional data can be easily added in the future, and that'll provide even more capabilities for those uh, to find those insights. So as a result of this, um, we, decided it was kind of time to, to focus a little less on the traditional, you know, beautiful static looking reports that are produced on a, you know, monthly or yearly cadence, focus a little bit more on an interactive metrics on demand type of a solution. Um, you know, the, the year over year comparisons are great and there's still a, a place for them. And we're still gonna be doing them, but we want to get a little bit more in depth of the, you know, simply comparing the, you know, things like, um, the number of events or roadside assists from last year to this year. We're now leveraging the power of this tool to identify some insights and be using those insights to report and present the lessons learned and support that future decision-making. Um, so you can see on the left there is our formal static report. We're still gonna be doing that, but on the right is the interactive tool. It's a little bit more, I guess, intended for, for geeking out over some data. Um, so since we're all working remotely, uh, my kids and wife are all on video calls all day long too, so I decided not to risk a slow internet connection and do a live demo. Um, but I've got a ton of screenshots that I want to show you guys that will hopefully give you a feel of, you know, what this program is. Um, so as you can see, it's definitely not as pretty as a static report. Um, but it's the most important part of this thing is that it's very interactive. Uh, you can see that there's various selections available to the user. This is kind of the user input landing page where they can say, okay, what do you want to take a look at? And the analysis period is there. The data baseline is there. I kind of blew those up on the right for you to see because I'm not sure if it's if it's coming too tiny on your screen or not. But um, the user is able to type in dates or use those sliders to select, you know, I want, to, I want to compare this week versus a baseline last year in March or whatever it may be. The user is also able to select, you know, the specific corridor. In this case, it was I-94. And we've got um, what, five little segments inside that entire corridor to, to look at that analysis. So perhaps there was a crash during this period or, or an incident response that the um, end user wanted to evaluate. So that's kind of the setup of how the user starts their analysis. Um, you can see, I'll, get, I'll skip ahead a little bit. On the bottom here, there's kind of a, a little you know, tabs almost set up like a spreadsheet. So once the, once the user gets through the analysis criteria, each little tab there um, can be clicked on to look at the various data sets that are currently integrated. 
And like I said, our goal is to continue to expand this so that that little scroll bar hopefully gets longer and longer as more data sets come into the TMCs and we figure out how to ingest those. Um, this is just an example of travel time uh, or planning time index. Um, and this was for this example, it was the first month of Michigan's stay at home order due to the coronavirus. And you can see the historical baseline there is in yellow, indicating some congestion there in the AM and PM peak, uh, where the red is the analysis period. Obviously some significant decline in the travel times there. Um, you know, we also use this segment in this data to calculate the, um, the impact to the motorists. In this case, you can see there's about a minute and a half saved per motorist over this 13 mile segment, which is pretty significant. Um, it totaled about 350,000 minutes over the one month period. Obviously, this is kind of an extreme example, but you can see how this could help show you know, overall impact to either the public for various events or first responders or construction staff or however you want to present this data. I already talked about that navigation screen on the bottom. This is just another example of using the same data, same analysis period, but presented in a little bit different way, kind of monetizing, you know, showing the user delay costs of of this type of event or this analysis. I mentioned that this was a very interactive tool. So one of the other cool things is we once we get into the you know, selection of the baseline and the analysis period overall, we can uh, really dive into this data like, like you're seeing here. Um, click around and display point information. This is 7.45 a.m. comparing an analysis with a, with a baseline. Um, and this is broken down into 15 minute periods. Um, you can also see that I, in the upper right there, I selected a few different time periods there to, to kind of scrunch the graph down and show just the AMP to kind of give you the idea of you know, the difference there. Again, pretty extreme example here since our volumes dropped by 66% during this week, but um, you can kind of get an idea of the power. This is probably the least pretty of all the pages, but it's, it's definitely the most interactive. Um, here we're showing kind of roadway details and analysis, really granular, um, and everything on this page is clickable. It's broken down by capacity impacts and time of day. So what I have highlighted there in the yellow is, you know, just a incident related impacts during that analysis period. How many, how many impacts blocked one lane, all lanes, no lanes, um, and then at what, what percentage of time during what peak period or what time period is there. Um, and then in the bottom, once you, you, you can see all the, in the blue there, you can see all the, the incidents that were associated with the numbers that are displaying above. So, you know, users can click on a certain percentage here. In this case, you know, um, the highlighted yellow, and I apologize again if it's tiny to see, um, but again, it's not a pretty thing. It's, it's built for useful insights and digging into the data. But the, you know, they click on that one lane blocked 17% during that three to 6 p.m. period. It highlights itself and kind of grays out all the other data on there. And then in the blue down there, it filters all of the crashes that are, um, that were managed by the TMC. And it tells you exactly what that crash was, you know, right lane blocked or right lane closed due to a crash. And it gives you the incident clearance time. There's a whole bunch of other details on there that show up too, but you know, for sake of the presentation, I didn't want to make it infinitely small for everybody to see. But, you know, if you click on a different percentage up there in the analysis breakdown, you'll see more incidents that were related to that data set. So I mentioned, you know, we've got lots of data from various sources. Um, we want to use them all, right? Each piece of data is used for a specific purpose. And each piece of data might have a small little nuance that kind of makes you wish, you know, I wish I had another piece of data to, to supplement that or to validate what this one says. Um, you know, for example, RITUS is a, is a wonderful tool and it's been a large part of nearly every traffic analysis that we, we do now. Um, however, RITUS kind of has a little bit of a limitation, limitation with providing, you know, access to real time speeds and volumes. A lot of that information is either delayed a little bit as it comes to the TMC, it's processed, you know, the peaks are kind of smoothed out or it might be estimated based on a historical ADT. Um, so in order to see that entire picture of the, of the event or the analysis period that we're looking at, um, you know, we need to be able to overlay those other data sets such as those from the TMC, roadside sensors, things like that. Um, so 
you know, a little bit of an application example. Obviously, there's been a lot of impacts due to the coronavirus. Um, and this is just, this is kind of a low hanging fruit. I'm sure you guys have noticed it in your area too. Um, you know, there's decreased volumes, which leads to increased speeds, fewer crashes, and higher severity incidents. Um, but what we were able to do is we were able to dive into that a little bit more using this tool. Um, you know, like I said, most of our time has been kind of developing this tool, so it's not ready for full-blown analysis and integrate all the data we've ever seen before. But, you know, we be begin to notice some of the, the trends that are happening and, and get a few insights. So, you know, for example, when responding to an incident, we've found that first responders tend to take a couple more lanes than they have in the past for similar incidents. Um, you know, we've also noticed that a lot of the construction closures are shifting from the overnight period uh, to the daytime period. So looking at each of those issues on an isolated basis kind of makes sense, right? Um, you know, less traffic means the less opportunity, um, or less traffic means the opportunity to close more lanes with the perception that, hey, we're not gonna cause as big of an impact. So we're gonna give ourselves a little bit more room to work or get the work to get, uh, to get the scene cleared or whatever. Um, but, you know, with this tool, we're able to analyze these impacts of the work zones and the incidents. Um, in order to compare them to previous events. And we can then utilize those results to, you know, support the trends that are occurring, um, offer suggestions on how to minimize those impacts, whether it's different timeframes, different work zone setups, um, things like that, or even facilitate with, you know, facilitate the conversations with first responders and construction staff to say, hey, here's the kind of impacts you guys are having. Let's have a broader discussion on, is this the right thing to do globally for the whole traffic system? Um, like I said, it's still a very new process. We're still working out some of the bugs, um, but we're really excited to continue to develop and integrate this tool. Um, you know, future changes, kind of a vision that we're looking at is, you know, we want a warehouse that holds all the data and a simple user interface that overlays all that data in one spot for the people to analyze at the end, whether it's an operator, an engineer, a manager, or whoever it is. Um, we want to aggregate more data sets into that warehouse provide it as a real-time solution. You know, safety service patrol, they get, they have a lot of data. Um, let's integrate that, right? But right now it's in their own silos that we have to use a different login, a different user interface to get that data and then kind of manually compare it. I would love to overlay that and that's where we're going with this tool. Um, you know, weather data, CAD data, crowdsourcing, all that kind of fun stuff. You know, I'm kind of geeking out right now, but I love data, so. Um, the big thing is we want to increase our automation, you know, not only for the future data sets that we add, but for the, the monthly and weekly and, and project specific analysis that we do. And you know, we spend a lot of time validating and gathering and comparing data. Let's shift that time. Let's automate this. Let's shift that time from gathering and validating and hammering the data to looking at those insights, you know, not only looking at the roadway that, hey, here's where the construction project was from A to B. What was our impact just in advance of A? Let's look at the next corridor over or the two corridors over. What kind of impact did we have on those corridors based on the, the, the work zone or whatever that we have on, on the primary corridor? Um, you know, and obviously collaborating with the end users is super important. This isn't just a tool for, for us. This isn't just a tool for the DOT. It's a tool for everybody to use to, to make the roadway network better for all. Um, I'll leave you guys with just a few little lessons learned. You know, Power BI has its limitations. We're, we're feeding Power BI about 3 million records per month, and we're starting to get to the point where it's, it's chugging a little bit. It's reaching its maximum capacity. But the beauty, the beauty of this is that we have this data stored somewhere else. Power BI is the overlay, right? So we can use a different overlay to process that data and still keep our data warehouse intact. Um, you know, I would, if, if you're looking at doing this kind of thing, definitely involve more end users in the, in the setup of the concept development. You know, initially we kind of took a look at it from an engineering, engineering perspective and how are we gonna use this? But then once we started showing this to others, they're like, well, can you add this? And we, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. So, you know, it just ends up with a better end product by including more people at the beginning. Um, definitely incorporate as much automation as possible, focus your time on your insights, and then, you know, plan for the expansion. So the other thing is, you know, this is also kind of future stuff, but be involved in how the data is acquired, right? All this stuff is in proprietary silos right now, and we need to get it into that warehouse. So whether it's end user agreements, figuring out how to get access to that data, 
Um, some data comes with weird outputs, right? I don't want all my wind speeds coming to me in metric. Everything I use right now is a different data set or a different unit. So make that happen, right? As you're purchasing the data um, and then focus on automation. So with that, um, you know, tools and data sets that are for procured in isolation are great, but there's so many more possibilities when you can combine all that data. So I know I went through that kind of fast. Um, I think I'm right at 15 minutes. Um, hopefully I was able to give you an idea what this tool can do. Yeah, thanks, Paul. That's, that's great. Um, I'm watching for any questions that come in. Um, you know, just my reaction is, is, you know, doing something that helps make better use of your data required you to think about the cradle to grave of the data life cycle, right? Every part of it you had to, how are you ingesting it? How are you cleaning it? How are you analyzing it and how do you archive it? So those are all, mm -hmm. that, that's really a lot. It's, it's so much more than the few graphs that, that Paul showed to, to manage that well. Um, and of course, this is, this is an engineer's tool, right, Paul? This isn't, this isn't gonna be public consumption or anything. Um, just kind of curious what the uh, reaction has been to this uh, from, you know, the engineers that are otherwise struggling to do their Excel spreadsheets and so forth. Yeah, th this has been really cool for our analysts on site. Um, you know, previously they're looking at data sets that are coming out, you know, per minute, and then they're comparing it to data sets that are in 15 minute bins or one hour long bins, and just kind of crunching those to, to make them line up nicely has been difficult. But now it lines up automatically so they can focus that, you know, processing time and really come up with insights on what's happening on the corridor and relaying that to the to the operators on the floor. And yeah, it is it is definitely more of an engineering tool. There's no plans right now to roll this out to the public, um, but you know, there's nothing in there that anybody is trying to hide. So, you know, it's like I said, it's still pretty new and there haven't been broader discussions about letting that go out to anybody else. So right now it's just, it's kind of kept on the engineering side. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Paul. Um, thank you. And, you know, before we go any farther, I just want to kind of reiterate, we do want to start with problem statements. We're really focusing a lot on the data and the, the tools needed to manage the data. But, you know, just to back up a minute, you know, Chrissy's first presentation is about a very dynamic work zone that, you know, the operators are probably constantly change, you know, chasing what's going on out there and what kind of message should I put up and what, when should I change the message again? And, you know, the solution was, well, let's automate that. Let's put enough uh, infrastructure in the field that, so that that can be automated and relieve the burden of the operator to simply managing and, and monitoring the system as opposed to creating messages constantly. So, you know, that was kind of the problem statement is, is probably the, you know, the operator effort needed to be accurate and timely with the information. And then moving into Paul's presentation was simply the overload of data and the fact that, you know, we're gonna get new data sources uh, uh, for the next foreseeable future, if not forever. And how does that data compare, if it's the same type of data, how does that compare to our previous data set? If it's a new data source, what kind of data should we combine it with to create better value. And so it's the frustration of, you know, data is the friend of the engineer, but also the enemy of us all if we're trying to use it. So, you know, those are kind of the problem statements we're, we're working with right now. And uh, the next presentation by Chrissy is going to talk about freeway service patrol operations. And again, we want to make sure you hear the, the problem statement since, you know, that's where the starts is, is no solution should start without, you know, first investigating the problem. So Chrissy, I can hand it over to you and uh, let's hear about uh, freeway patrol operations. Okay, so uh, what we're gonna be looking at is a management dashboard and this was created um, for NDOT to um, see the operations, the operator operations and the fr freeway service patrol operations. Um, unlike Paul's we're not using probe data. What we're doing on ours is we're using, um, we, we use a gem system um, 
to record all the incidences that the operators, whether it has to do with freeway service patrol, statewide crashes, maintenance, construction, um, call outs, all that good stuff. Um, everything the operator does in the TMC, they record it in the gym system. Um, so for our dashboard, um, the raw gym data comes out at the first of every month. So we load this information on the transfer data site and our dashboard will show the previous month. Now we are hoping one day um, we're moving to an open source um, programs. We're in the middle of doing that. So hopefully one day we are gonna wanna use the probe data and have a live dashboard. Um, so it's, it's really simple how the, the information or the data gets, gets onto the dashboard. Um, all we do is once a month when this comes out, we'll load the monthly gym data in CSV form and Excel form. And every day at 11.45 a.m., the transfer data site does an automatic refresh. So if I've loaded anything on there, it's gonna show on the dashboard. Um, same thing uh, with Paul's, in order to get access, um, and the more people is better, um, we, we just invite them into the dashboard. And then we have it set up to where we invite the NDOT managers. And then if the NDOT managers wants to invite anybody within their organization or without, they can decide to do that on their page. Um, so pretty simple. You click into the dashboard and this is our dashboard. The first page month to date summary is meant to show you only the previous month's data. Um, on all the other pages, you'll be able to look at uh, historical data, multiple months, multiple years. Um, so your first page is just a month to date summary for we're seeing November 2020 right now. Um, this enables the client to look and see the productivity of the Hoosier helper staff, which is our freeway service patrol and the operators. So field staff is the Hoosier helpers and the center staff are the operators. Um, so we're constantly monitoring. We have close to 500 cameras statewide. We're, we're constantly monitoring in cameras. We have freeway service patrols in Southern Indiana, which is Fall City, uh, Central Indianapolis, and up North in Gary, Indiana. So those are our three service patrol areas and our center covers all three. Um, so what you can see here is, this was also created um, because we wanted to see not, not only the productivity, but with the Hoosier helper staff, we see they're getting all these numbers and all these stats, but are they are they stats that mean something? If if someone's pulling up on a vehicle and they're leaving the vehicle there, we kind of haven't done our job. Sometimes we can't help it. Um, sometimes it's just someone using a cell phone. Sometimes it's it's a repair that can't be made by our our, our freeway service patrol, um, but. If, if we're driving up to a vehicle and they're still there, we haven't got them off the road and it's still a safety concern. Same thing with abandoned vehicles. So uh, this first page shows three of the most unwanted stats that, that we want, and it's welfare check, it's call to bank on arrangements, or disregard drive off. So if someone's shown a high number and a lot of them are one of these three, they need to work with them on it. Or what can we be doing better to get these people off the road? And an interesting thing is out of 419, we're giving them the operators finding 79 of them, 65 out of that. The drive offs, 1,574. So 100% on most of our drive offs is something an operator found. So we can work with the um, operators also. So this tool is for both of them. Um, your main page also shows. Um, average blocking time, average blocking impact for each, each again, each, um, each freeway service patrol, sorry. As you start to dive into it, and these are the tabs Paul was talking about also, this is where you can get more interactive with the dashboard. So um, it, it's defaulting to November, everything's interactive. You can 
you can select multiple months at a time. Not that month. Uh, you can you can select it. Sometimes it takes a minute to load too. Um, okay. And if you select multiple months, the good thing about it is, is when you go to each tab, it's saving those months until you change it. So if you're needing to, to figure something out about a situation or some stats, each tab, you don't have to go and reselect the months. So that's the great thing about it too, because that would be a lot of clicking. Um, we'll go back to November. Um, you can hover over lines. You don't have to click on anything. Um, you can hover over to get information. You can interact with these maps. Um, you can click on a map. It's gonna change your response times. It's gonna change what the numbers down here for the guys. Um, you can select multiple with the control function. Now this is the um, free version of Power BI. So when you get the uh, more advanced version, there's a lot more you can work with. Um, as you click on people, you'll notice the changes in the, the changes, very interactive. Um, one thing about our dashboard is um, until we get to our new programs that we're using open source, the information can only be as accurate as it can be. What we found out while making this dashboard is we've been capturing a lot of um, information that might not be correct. And an example of that is blocking time. In our gym system, um, we have an attribute box that says if, if something's blocking, the operator clicks it. Now, when the road opens, we, we click a, a certain date and time. So what the data is catching they don't know what time we click the attribute box, but they know what time we, we click the road open. So knowing this on the new systems that are created or that are being created, we're able to start capturing that information better. Um, with the open source, I think everybody knows that um, a lot goes into that and you can change it to how you want. So we've been, we've been able to create, we're still in the process of creating it a better open source program for the operators to use that will capture better data. Um, again, interactive, you can hover over, it will change the numbers on the operators. Um, another thing that we've done is going back to the um, who's your helper survey, survey service patrol is that they end up decided to categorize their stats in three categories. One is HH detail one, red, those are the ones they don't want. That's the disregard, welfare checks, unable to locate. They're getting stats off these numbers. We go through State Farm as our sponsor and they wanna see our numbers. So even though we have high numbers, we're still not, and it's like I said, not their fault, maybe doing what needs to be done to get them off the road. So they did create a level three car detail. It's called capacity. Capacity adding result, meaning the vehicle's no longer there. Um, stuff like first aid, traffic control are major, major functions of a freeway service patrol, jump start, giving gas, all that stuff is, is major things. So NDOT decided they wanted to see more of this happening. So um, even though the guys didn't, the, the patrollers didn't like it, they have been given a 0.8 per hour quota um, of a level three. Our level threes have went up since this has happened. We've had this dashboard for two years now and um, evaluations for the guys are given off of this dashboard. Um, so since the dashboard came out, it seems like they've been doing more to get the vehicles off the side of the road. Um, you can click on Here's removed from roadway. You'll see that these are all our freeway service patrol guys. You'll see their numbers change. You can see who's done what. Average response times, on scene times, they change with the clicks to the interactive clicks. You can clear slicers and start all over. 
Um, we got, and I, as well, sometimes this stuff happens and I apologize. Dashboard crashed. Believe it or not, this has never happened to me before until today. Live demonstrations <laughs> are for the course. Back up. <laughs> Again, I apologize. Some of the some of the most cluttered tabs are the best to see and the best to use. Um, durations per assist. Um, it has a lot of information on here. This is everything the operator has done, everything the Hoosier helper has done. But there, the managers can look at this and see if if too much time is being spent on something. You can actually see if if. People are going out of their zones. You can actually see um, it, there's been a lot of um, counseling for operators and for Hoosier helpers. I have found a lot of um, problems that our operators were doing incorrectly off this dashboard. And that's a great thing about this. Another great thing about this is um, we've been able to present this dashboard and we put more cameras up in the Fort Wayne area um, due to um, activity that's happening. You can see on this map, of course, these three sections are the darkest because uh, that's where our Hoosier helpers are. But in the Fort Wayne area, um, do we need to do we need to put our programs out there? So what's happened with this is that um, NDOT has decided to put cameras up in the Fort Wayne area and possibly put Hoosier helpers uh, in the Fort Wayne area. You can see the hotspots, even though it's not live, you can see what they have done monthly, yearly. Um, so we're in the, we're, we're about to broaden our program. Um, so that is a good thing that's happened with this too. Um, another clunky one is This one right here. So upon first look, you're like, what is this? Um, but um, you can look at your crashes. Let me pick a good month. Uh, so let me pick a month. I'm having a problem with the dashboard right now. It's not working correctly. And like I said, I apologize. Um, you can turn that clunkiness into not clunkiness by filtering down what you want to look, look at. Um, October 204 disregarded. You can pick multiple things at one time. Um, let's go to a level three. Mark, my dashboard's messing up. Yeah, that, that's totally fine. I, you know, I think you've shown us uh, a lot of ways that the data can be uh, sliced different ways and visualized different ways. And I think that's, that's the, the message here in terms of the incredible number of attributes related to this program. I do apologize for that. That was the first time. No worries. So, you know, Chrissy, I'm, I'm looking at your presentation and thinking somebody had an accountability question or needed just justification for the program or just was curious as all get out about uh, how many people asked for fuel versus needed, a, you know, this, this type of service or that type of service, which is, I guess, only natural when, when there's so many services being provided. Yeah, and you can also see repeat offenders because we, we uh, get the plates of every vehicle um, that we pull up on if, if available. So repeat offenders, um, it, great things have came out of this. Um, and I wish I could show you more, but um, it, it's, it's gonna broaden us. 
for sure. It's, it's so the data is being collected. Work. Now you can actually drill down with relative ease. Yes. And in the future, we will have live data. When we do that, we're going to get the not free version. So it may be not mess up, mess up on us, but um, we will start using probe data as soon as our open source is done and, and all that good stuff. They just, we, we have to get that completed before we make it better. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Chrissy. Thank you. All right. I am not seeing questions, so we're going to move on to our next presentation, if that's all right with everyone. Feel free to use the chat box uh, as you would like to put your questions there. We'll get to them after the next presentation. Uh, our next presenter is Don Avery, and he's as about far south as you can go in these United States, I believe. And uh, he's going to talk about a tool that's been put together to share a video with first responders. And while this isn't data in the sense of, uh, you know, data from a detector, uh, certainly video is, um, you know, a critical part of what we do now in a TMC with video being so prevalent. Uh, most every TMC has a ton of video coming back. And so this is just being smarter with uh, the resource that, that we have. Don? All right, thank you, Mark. As uh, Mark said, yes, I am coming live from sunny Miami at the Sun Guide Transportation Management Center, um, where it is a brisk 75 degrees, but I did have to put my jacket on because it feels like 35 in my office right now. Um, okay, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, we are gonna talk a little bit about our development of our responder site. Um, and Mark, I'll, rel I'll rely on you in case something's not showing up right here, but you can see my screen. Um, just a little background of uh, where, what we do here in, in Miami. Uh, so Florida Department of Transportation, we're District 6. Uh, there are eight districts in the state. We cover Miami-Dade County and Monroe County. Uh, Miami-Dade obviously is pretty much the city of Miami and surrounding cities. Um, and Monroe County covers the Florida Keys, which is uh, 105 plus miles of a one, uh, a two or four lane uh, roadway from uh, basically from Key Largo all the way down to Key West, city of Key West. Uh, Miami-Dade is very urban. It's very dense. Um, we have a lot that goes on in a, in a relatively small area. Monroe County is a little more rural in the sense and uh, the events are more isolated. We do have some areas where um, it's pretty much out in the middle of nowhere where when we do have an incident. Uh, we use the, the SunGuide ATMS, uh, which is the, the statewide software to handle uh, ITS devices, uh, cameras, dynamic message signs and, and such, and uh, record all of our event data and operator actions. Okay, so what we needed to do here was to be able to provide camera images and event information to our first responders and other municipalities that have interest in this. Um, we have uh, a lot of cameras in the area. Um, we did have an interface for first responders um, several years ago, uh, which we call the responders page. It allowed responders to select cameras um, and it was a kind of a clunky, it was written in Expression Engine. It was a little clunky as far as its interface. Um, eventually it became outdated. Um, it was developed by a local university and the, the person that was doing the support left. So um, no one, once that person left, we didn't know how to support it anymore. Plus once we started doing our penetration tests, it was deemed a security risk. So we basically had to decommission it. So we wanted to be able to provide that service back to our, our, um, our, our partners. We do have a very active traffic incident management team, both in Miami-Dade and Monroe counties. Um, we also have um, a program called RISC, um, Rapid Incident Scene Clearance Program, which is a, uh, instead of a base contract to give um, uh, recovery companies 
that are responding to large scale events like an overturned tractor trailer um, incentive to get the roads opened as soon as possible. So those wrecking companies are, are road ranger towing companies. Uh, they also have an interest in something like this. So moving forward in developing or redeveloping this kind of an interface, we did talk to our partner agencies to see what did they like from the old one, what didn't they like. And we kind of found out that um, they were really using it as their default video wall. Um, they would have either from, a, like say, a Miami-Dade fire rescue person or Miami-Dade traffic signals uh, would set up several instances of, of the interface and put up multiple cameras and kind of have a video wall on their um, on their monitors. So we took that into account. Um, and then moving forward, we looked at different alternatives and what's out there. And initially we wanted to do some sort of a uh, streaming video, video distribution type of system, but we had to really outweigh the, the functionality versus the cost. Um, looking at some of the really nice video distribution systems that are out there, it, it started to get very pricey. And, and especially with the amount of bandwidth that we were going to have to uh, either either handle or have someone else handle. So we decided to do this in-house. Um, fortunately, um, I had a, uh, a junior programmer come on board um, at the beginning of the year. And um, so we started, well, let's, let's see what this person, what, what, this, what this guy can do. Uh, so we developed the, um, the mission statement, we developed the scope, and uh, wanted to roll this out in several phases. We wanted this to be something that's like a living application that can allow um, further enhancement without causing disruption to the system itself. So the main goal right off the bat was to get access to the cameras. Um, like I said, we do have the, the SunGuide software, um, but that is mainly in-house um, application, there are some remote people that are able to have access to it. Um, Florida does have a 511 system where you can go on and take a look at the cameras, but um, they we do send video to them, but now they've they become very low resolution screenshots. We recently completed a complete upgrade of our camera systems to HD. So we wanted to take a, advantage of the, the clear images that we were getting now. And we also wanted to allow the first responders to have access to event data. You know, if they got onto the site, they could actually see what is happening right now, what, what's causing lanes blockage, lanes being blocked out there, um, and so forth. So this is just a quick snapshot of um, actually one of our Power BI uh, applications and uh, a look at all the cameras that we have available. So we set forth to develop the responder site. Um, we decided we would, if people wanted to take a look at like a little mini video wall that we would provide up to four camera images um, and to be able to select those images pretty easily. Uh, so that was basically phase one. It took us about three months to get to that point. <clears throat> uh, we, can, we did complete our phase two enhancements, which allowed um, uh, access to our event list and uh, an improved camera interface. And I'll, I'll show you that as we go into the, into the demonstration. And then we have some future enhancements coming up later on. So let me just go into this. And let's see if this works. Okay, so you should be seeing our, so you can access this through our homepage, sunguide.info. If you want to take a look at where it is. Um, we do have a traffic incident management team site on the page. You scroll down to our incident responder site. Um, <clears throat> we wanted this to be user controlled access because this, this level of access, uh, you know, we really are restricting it to um, those partner agencies in our, in our region that should have access to these, these images. Sign in here. This is Chrissy's presentation. I'm crossing my fingers here. So, 
Okay, so here's the here's the interface. Uh, let me try and move this. I can hide that. Ah, that's better. Okay. So scrolling down, you can see our our just complete list of cameras is gone. We've filtered it now per roadway. So <clears throat> let's select a couple of cameras on I-95. And there was an incident earlier, so let's see if it's still there. And we'll select a couple of cameras in the Florida Keys as well. Okay. And there's your video wall. So you can, it, <clears throat> so obviously it's not video streaming. Um, we are taking snapshots. The, the interface itself is written in Java. We used Angular to help with, um, with some of the um, kind of standard features rather than coding something that's already out there. Um, the data, we're, we're getting the images straight from the cameras. We're using the URLs from the HD, uh, from the HD cameras. Uh, the event information we're getting from our SunGuide database. So a first responder, if they wanted to, they, if they're happy with these four, they can keep that. They can open another instance and get four more cameras if they want, or they can continue to, to change these cameras around by just going down and selecting where they want the cameras in these different boxes. <clears throat> All right, so let's move on to our event list. I just had a camera update here. Let's see. All right, here we go. Okay, our event list is what's currently happening right now. We're in our off-peak period, so it's it's pretty light. But however, we do have a crash, so you're in luck. Um, <clears throat> so this is on 95, our 95 Express southbound lanes at Ives Dairy Road. Uh, we also add a link to the nearest camera, so you can click on the link and see. Um, It'll take you right to where hopefully an operator is, is, is looking at it and it's got it focused on there and you can see what's going on in that link. So yes, you can see that we have our, um, our road rangers on site, looks like with the flatbed wrecker. We have Florida Highway Patrol and um, road ranger tow trucks and support providing MOT. We do split the uh, events into lane blockage and non-lane blockage. So um, let's see, we do have a, looks like a crash on a shoulder. Let's see what this is. And yeah, looks like something's going on there. See a pickup truck on the side of the road and a bunch of people standing around. So yeah, something happened there. That is basically the tool. Um, we've gotten some very good uh, feedback so far. Um, once we released it, uh, the phase one implementation in, um, in March of this year, we had about 50 people right away jump in on it. Once we, we launched phase two, about three months after that, which is what you're seeing now, um, <clears throat> we're now up to over 150 users and um, future enhancements. Now we're working on some, um, again, we're still trying to improve the uh, refresh rate of the cameras. Eventually we are gonna try to get the streaming video and we're also working on a map um, GUI so that you can pick the cameras from the map rather than, um, say, oh, there we are. rather than from the, um, for the, from the dropdown list. And that is basically it. Let's turn it back over to Mark. Yeah, I like the sound of 150 users in uh, what about nine months. That's that's nothing to sneeze at right there. Yeah, that it, it's again. It, I think the the ease of use and um, and this event list information is uh, and plus the images are really nice. I mean, the the HD even though first responders don't necessarily need the streaming video, um, they just need to be able to see nice snapshots of what what's happening at a given point. So. Um, 
that was the trade-off was we'll, we'll give you nice clean images, but it's going to be uh, not streaming. At least right Very now. good. Yeah, that's, that's terrific. Um, you'll, I'm sure you'll be continuing to ask the question, is this good for you? But it looks like you've nailed down the, the user uh, ease of use uh, uh, issue. That's, that's terrific. And I think that's what's expected these days. If it's not easy to use, probably not going to go too well for you. Yeah, this is, um, and this is something that's really great to when we go to our, um, we hold, uh, you know, periodic meetings. Um, we've increased our meetings. So we do, uh, well, several meetings uh, with our Tim teams. And we always showcase that showcase this. There's usually somebody that hasn't seen it before. And they're, you know, there's a lot of interest in this. Fantastic. I'm looking at the chat. I don't see questions. So man, we're, we're hitting 100 here on completeness, I guess. But uh, please uh, use the chat if you have any questions. Uh, Don, do you have anything else? Or are you? Uh, are you pretty good right there? Um, I think I am good. All right. So yeah, you, you know, video is a funny thing. And, and you're right, the bandwidth requirements is pretty crazy stuff. So a successful video sharing arrangement is no, no small feat. Uh, so thank you for, for the report. Uh, yeah, the one thing I would say if you're going to do something like this is, you know, um, just watch out what you tell some of the different video distribution companies that are out there. When we started talking about what we wanted as far as, you know, once we just one before we knew what we needed to scale down to, uh, we could just tell the, you know, the eyes were bugging out of their uh, eye sockets with dollar signs. And that's when we decided, okay, we gotta, we gotta scale this back. <laughs> it's going to be very expensive. So. Great. Well, thank you. And um, I'm going to pause this for a minute here and see if any questions come in. You know, we've really tried to stretch our, our net over a lot of stuff between, you know, the typicals in, in the TMC environment between just the sheer data requirements to construction to uh, service patrol and, and first responder needs. So, you know, hopefully something here grabs you and is useful. Um, this session will be recorded and I think it'll be available almost immediately for playback from the ITS Georgia website uh, following this meeting. So um, feel free to uh, refer to this later or share with others if you think they, it has value. Um, I think we're going to turn gears now. And um, I've asked Catherine to uh, give us, um, you know, if, if, uh, if there's three easy things we can do uh, to uh, use data already available to us and to make data work for us, what would they be? And Catherine, who's working at the TMC for the uh, operations contract as the quality manager. Um, she's been working in RITAS for some time and thought these uh, items would be of particular interest. So uh, Catherine, you can take it away. All right, sounds great. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Catherine Johnson and I am the GDOT TMC operations quality manager. And today we're going to talk about RITAS applications to enhance operations. Going through, we have a quick introduction. We're gonna go through our top three tips, RITUS alerts, dashboards, bottlenecks, and have a quick closing. Now for the introduction, what is RITUS? The Regional Integrated Transportation Information System is a software platform developed by the CAT Lab that provides a variety of metrics, including live traffic metrics, speed and travel time, bottleneck analysis, and user delay cost. Let's look into our problem statement. We want to investigate traffic conditions near I-285 and Georgia 400 as part of their ongoing construction project, Transform 285-400. And our question is, how can we utilize a holistic approach to monitor this area? Let's take a look at our first tip with RITUS alerts. So would you like RITUS notifications about incidents, weather, and construction events? Subscribe to custom-related RITUS alerts via email, text, or both. I'm going to walk you guys through these following um, items on the right side. So we're going to define our route, name our subscription, define our incident types, including closed lanes, time of day, give the contact information you want to receive the alerts for, confirm, and we're done. So we're going to get started by going to ridis.org slash traffic. I'm going to move. 
Okay, and then we're going to go to personal traffic alerts, which is this top tab. I have a couple of um, subscriptions already already created and we're going to click new incident subscription. So first we see this map to build our route. I'm going to jump to the state of Georgia. From there, we can zoom in. And the way that these subscriptions are, it's um, you're setting them up almost as if you're driving through an area. So I want to start with this one area of I-285. I'm going to click make this my start point. And as you can see, a pin is dropped in the area. And I know that the project's over here, but I want to start on this side of 85 so that I can catch any incidents along this area. Let's say that I want um, to end on this part right here. I'm going to add a waypoint. And if you zoom out, then you can see that we have a point from A to B. If this is enough for you, you can go ahead and click next step. However, if you're interested in getting the other direction, we'll go back to that other area, add another waypoint. And if you zoom out, you can see that it's created a route for them to turn around using this waypoint. If you have a complex route that you'd like to follow, add a little bit more waypoints so that you can make sure that um, Ritus knows where you'd like to go. This is enough for me, so I'm going to click next step. From here, we're going to name our subscription. Naming is always good. It shows up in the catalog later. So I'm going to call this I-285 routes. Okay. For the next step, we're going to include our incident type. So if you're interested in specific incidents, you can um, unclick all of these. And let's say you just want to see collisions, incidents, road work, and let's see, water main break. We can go to the next step. This is where we specify our closed lanes. So if in addition to those incident types, you'd like to see, um, you'd like to get an alert whenever lanes are closed beyond a certain threshold, you can click, okay, well, I want to see when half of the lanes are closed. So that way I know that it's um, a serious incident and we can get items over there. You can also um, have the default alert, which says alert me regardless of any lanes that are closed which is great if you're operating or um, monitoring that area. Going to our next step, we can specify multiple times of day that, we, that we'd like alerts. So let's say that you're working a specific shift and you would like to say, hey, I'm only interested between eight and 11.45. You can also adjust it by day of the week. You can add multiple time ranges, whatever tickles your fancy. Let's go to our next step. Contact information. So. You can input your email. You can also include um, your phone number for text messages. You would just select your carrier and place that information in. And then as a confirmation, they'll show you everything that's listed out in front of you. So we've selected a route. We've confirmed our subscription name. We want to see these specific incident types. Alert me when 0% or more of the lanes are closed, which just means if there's any lane closures. We have specific time of days that we would like and our contact information is included. So once we subscribe, we're all good to go. You can see um, we have our I-285 routes on this fourth line right here and it shows me the details. And if I need to, I can always go back and edit. All right. So I just had a couple of quick slides over here. Um, the incident types are always good because they allow you to see what kind of incident you're looking at. And then, um, oh, sorry. Let's go to our dashboards. So beforehand, we just looked at the RITUS alerts and that's if we want to receive an email, but what if we want to notify ourselves and see if there's not just those specific items, but other things that are going on? What if I want to see those in real time? I am on the pda.ritus.org suite and I'm going to go down to the bottom left where we see dashboard. I have already created one, but let me create a new dashboard. So on this right side, I'm, I'm selecting create a new dashboard. I'm going to call this I-285 test. Catherine, we had a question. Can we just of pause course. a second? I'm um, just curious, how does uh, RITUS know when lanes are closed? That is a great question. So I'm going to go to the help tab that's over here. And this is the probe data analytics suite. So let me pull up those RITUS alerts and we can go back and check out their help. So I am 
unsure of the specific way. And they usually have a, um, I'm on the Vitus help tutorials and they typically have a method that will show you, um, I would say details for a lot of these areas, but I can look into that and get an answer so that we can have an answer to that question. Yep, sorry to interrupt uh, your flow there. Let's, uh, we can cover it later too. No problem. Let's get back to dashboards. So um, as we mentioned, I just created a blank slate for dashboards. Let's go ahead and start adding in some of these widgets, which is the green icon. And we have a selection of eight dashboard widget types that we can add. Let's go ahead and go with one of the more simple ones, which is speed and travel timetable. Now this provides us with the map as well. And we have um, two options for selecting our routes. We have a road option and we have a save set for simplicity's sake. And if you guys are following along with me in this example, I have created a special example segment set that we can use. So if you go to display options and filter by text, type in example, and you'll see that um, we, have, uh, we have a segment set available, ITS Georgia example, I-285. So either you can double click or click the green button to add in these segment sets. And I wanted to see 285 from I-75 over here on the left to I-85 over here on the right so that we can see anything um, that's caught around the, the Georgia 400 285. So over here, we can select um, what kind of metrics we want to see in this specific widget. We have average speed. If we want to see the current historical and differential, same thing goes with travel time. In Georgia, and since we're in the metro Atlanta area, let's use here data. We can also use Vitix, uh, sorry, Enrix or TomTom. And on number four, we have the speed and travel timetable. I'm going to go with the default name, but if you wanted to, you can type in any additional name that you like, which could be helpful if you have several of these widgets and you're comparing them together. So I'm going to select add. It takes just a quick moment to load, but we'll be able to see it shortly. And here we go. So it will tell us our corridor, I-285 between I-75 and I-85. We can see the average speed, which is um, currently 65 miles per hour. And it's up 11 miles from its historic value of 54 miles per hour. And um, speed and travel time are opposites. So to travel from on 285 from I-75 to I-85, um, it takes you about 13 minutes which historically at this time would typically be about 16 minutes. One of the things to note about this is in the bottom right, you can see when this was updated. So it was updated at 127, which was this current minute, or sorry, my, uh, my clock is a little fast, 1254, and it'll tell you how many seconds ago that was. Let's go ahead and add in our, I want to see a ranked bottleneck comparison. Right now, um, the ranked bottlenecks table will show you bottlenecks in real time. However, I checked and it seems like the roads are clear, so we may not get any ranked bottleneck tables. So let's check out the ranked bottleneck comparisons. We're going to go along with the same method that we used before. I'm going to go into those save sets and TMC codes. And I believe that Bill has an example of TMC sets um, that I provided to him just in case you're not able to find this, um, this set. select our data source, which we're going to use as here. And I want to see the top 10 worst bottleneck locations. I'm going to add that widget and it shows us over here on this right table. Now, one of the cool things about this is that we can see our top bottleneck, which is I-285 going counterclockwise at Roswell Road. It seems like it's ranked pretty high over the past few months. Um, we can also see that one of the previous ones in March was I-285 at Peachtree Road. What this shows us is um, we can make comparisons from some of this data. We saw that consistently this number two bottleneck was here in, um, was number one for January, February, and March. But afterwards, it took a hiatus until August. You can say that due to the traffic volumes that we've experienced from the pandemic, that could possibly be a reason why and make those, um, make those data connections. So I always like looking at data and seeing where we end up ranking in the past couple of months. But let's look at another widget. I want to see the reliability table. I'm going to go ahead. And as you'll see, Ritis is has a very similar um, 
method for getting their data. You basically just select your route, select what kind of metrics you want with the date, and then you go ahead and add it. So I want to see AM peak and PM peak. So I'm going to do this twice and I'm going to call this um, AM reliability. And then while that's loading, I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing, reliability table. Add that in there and I want to see PM reliability and I'm going to name it as such. Okay, now in the interest of time, I have already created the dashboard. So I'm going to show you some of the completed items in here. Let me just refresh real quick. Let me go to our test. So this is using the same area some of the additional widgets that I have on here in this top left um, area, I have the event count. So this shows us how many events, um, whether they be incidents, road work, collisions, obstructions, or weather events occurred on these I-285 lanes. This is really helpful so that we can see a comparison between this current week and the same week last year. So as you see, um, overall, we had about 79 events this week, and, but last year it was about 133. You can also see um, a breakdown of how they all match up. So it does compare them. So it seems like um, this week we actually had a higher percentage of events, not number, but percentage compared to last year, which is something that's interesting. And you can see those comparisons um, through those bottom, uh, bottom tables, sorry, not tables, those bottom rows that we see over here on this chart. It looks like uh, our PM and AM peak reliability are having a little bit of trouble loading, but let's look at our interstate travel time reliability. This is um, pulled for the Atlanta Regional Commission area, so it's just the um, metro Atlanta area, but we can zoom in and see what our reliability is in this area. So it seems like we have a bit of construction um, going counterclockwise, but we saw that in one of our bottleneck um, one of our bottlenecks earlier, we can see our usual um, I-285, uh, I-85 congestion as well. And this can also help us identify some areas that may have increased or may have decreased compared to the um, travel time reliability. If you see L-O-T-T-R, that just stands for interstate travel time reliability. Okay, another interesting thing that, um, that's also shown in addition to this table. If we wanted to see it by month, we can see that same interstate uh, travel time reliability. And this is the map that corresponds up here. A Couple of these widgets um, may just need a little bit of time to load, but here we go. Looks like on our original, the PM and AM reliability have loaded. So we can see our planning time index um, that has gone down from what it was previously. So it looks like um, planning time is the amount of time that you need to plan to get to your destination on time in the easiest terms. Looks like that's getting a lot better. Just as a review, I just uh, went through some of the dashboards. So if you wanted to see in real time how a specific area is interacting, you have a variety of widgets at your disposal. So speed, travel time, um, ranked bottleneck, the reliability table, map 21, user delay cost table, ranked bottleneck comparisons, event counts, and clearance time. But what if we've already seen how things are going right now, but we like to look at how things were in the past? It's a quick thing. So bottlenecks. Bottlenecks view concentrated points of congestion on your custom route. You can use the RITA suite or you can download them into Power BI for more information. Um, for bottlenecks, it's a very similar method going through. We can um, select our roads. We have a time period selection. We can select our data source, our inclusion criteria, and then the time zone. So let's go ahead and pull that up. So I'm going to start a new. I'm at pda.ritis.org slash suite and ranking is what we used to get to our bottleneck ranks. 
going through that checklist I just mentioned earlier, we're going to use our example TMC set. I would like to see from the beginning of the year. So I want to see from January 1st to I'm going to go to yesterday so that we don't have impartial or I'll go to the end of November so that we can see these past 11 months. Um, I selected my data source as here. Number four is selecting your inclusion criteria. So let's say that um, if there was a bottleneck that happened, maybe not on this specific route, but a little bit outside of it that could be affecting your route, would you wanna know? If yes, go ahead and click this box. Just know that it may take a little bit longer to load the data that you're interested in. Our time zone is US and Eastern. So I'm going to go ahead and submit that information. So it looks like we are loading up and great. We do have a good amount of this information. Now I know that it might be a little bit of a data overload. So let me go through a couple of these. On the top, we have our title for our bottleneck rankings. This first table right here shows us a wealth of information and we have our bottleneck ranked. If you look at these columns over here, the one that has the downward facing triangle for filtering shows you how it's ranked. These are ranked by total delay. And as you hover over, it's the raw speed drop weighted by the VMT factor. Um, are you interested more in knowing about what these specific items mean? You could go to the help tab and find out more information. They break it down with all of the, you know, minute geeky details that you might be interested in. But let's look at how we have this right now. So as we see, we have this bottleneck. We can see it on the map. Bottlenecks have three main components. We have the first element that is the majority of the bottleneck, um, the second element and the third element. The farther that you get out, the less congestion you see. And um, the same is true with this bottleneck. So we can see that its average max length is about four miles and um, the average daily duration is about 43 minutes. Um, if you were to add up the total duration from these past 11 months, it would be 10 days, three hours and 13 minutes of total delay. We can also see interesting items such as the total amount of events and incidents, as well as base impact, speed, differential, congestion and total delay. But as you can see, our maps are a little, um, our timeline map is a little bit clustered. So I want to go back to my original page and I just want to look at one month just for my eyes. So you can um, pull a bottleneck report for up to the span of one year, just as a heads up. Okay, perfect. So the reason that I switched to a smaller time period is just, um, the longer ones take a little bit longer to load. And what I wanted to show you were these items or these lines that you see here. So as we hover over one to one of these, it's a very small diamond. Um, and it is either, it's an incident. So we can see details about it. Um, it's very difficult to see, but yellow is typically an incident. Orange is typically construction work. It'll show you um, when it starts and when it ends. Looking at these Q links, we can see um, from zero to two miles is the aqua color, two to five miles of congestion is the blue color, and that um, purple is from five to eight, and then over eight miles of congestion is that magenta color. One of the really cool things that I like using um, the bottleneck tool for is if you go to display options, you can select viewing incidents only during bottleneck conditions. This allows you to, um, to see incidents that may have caused congestion due to an accident and it's taking a while. Okay. Um, and it just updated. So I want to focus on this incident that happened on November 30th. Um, it essentially cleared and then it caused a congestion queue of about 6.76 miles. And um, it lasted for about two hours. I think that um, by using the bottleneck tool, we can see really just the impact of some of these incidents and maybe look more and find more connections into why we might have seen that congestion. Another uh, useful item that you can see is in that specific bottleneck, you can see not only the time of day where the congestion happened, but also where along your specific route you might have seen that. So it seems like um, this Peachtree Dunwoody exit 
28 is where we're seeing a lot of the congestion. Um, and you can highlight over these items and see um, the percentage of which they're congested most of the time. Then we have our time of day up here as well. And if we go to our main part, um, it's showing that around 530, we see the average miles congested. Um, 24 out of 30 days are affected. So it seems like this happens almost every day, even on the weekends. So that way we can start to make those patterns. And um, this could lead to a lot of changes, such as if we wanted more operators to, um, to monitor a specific corridor, or if we needed to say, hey, you know, um, make sure that you have cameras on during this shift in these main hotspot areas. By identifying these hotspots through bottlenecks, you can find more details. But if you're interested in one specific bottleneck, these external tool links will provide an overview um, and they'll open it up in a different area. So if I wanted to see that bottleneck in a performance chart, or if I wanted to see it um, with the user delay cost to see how much money this bottleneck is costing us, we can always click it. Um, and just as a, a note, our bottleneck reports, or sorry, our user delay cost reports come through in the form of history. But in general, um, bottleneck tools are very, very useful. They show us a variety of items and seeing the time of day as well as the location of the bottleneck and the severity of them really allow us to make those comparisons and um, find those patterns where we can help work towards solving the problems. So as a few closing remarks, and I wanted to get um, more into the Q&A, making those safe sets to analyze your specific areas save you a lot of time. Um, one thing that I did skip through was uh, drawing a specific route over the area, which as long as you can save it, you only have to do it once and it saves you so much time. Keep in mind that less traveled routes may have limited data um, and also to utilize the help and tutorial tabs. RIS is constantly changing and evolving. And as they add in new information, they post information about it um, showing, hey, this is what our new item is. This is how you use it. These are some helpful applications. Um, also, no need to worry if you lose one of your data sets that you've ran. The My Favorites tab has all of your um, previously ran reports available at your disposal. So you can, um, you can always pull up things historically and you can sort them as well. If you guys have any questions or if you're really just stuck on something, support at riddis.org is the email to contact the support system. And they are great. They, um, they have a really fast response time. They're really understanding and they work their best to help you get your issue resolved. So with that, Mark, um, I'd like to see if we have any questions. I know that I did uh, run through a couple of things for the sake of time, but I'm always happy to go back and, and revisit any areas. Well, I've got some questions if, if uh, we don't get any through the chat here. Um, I'm not seeing any new questions beyond the, how does RIDIS know when the lanes are closed at this point? Um, can you, can you uh, verify if, if uh, crash severity can be taken into account uh, in, in the number or the, uh, I guess the metrics of, of what's included with your with the Aridus analysis? That's a great question. And I believe that um, that information may be available to some, uh, to different TMCs. I'm not sure if it's available yet at um, for GDOT's TMC, but if you were to click on this incident and the severity was, um, was available, we should be able to see timeline links and more information about that specific um, area. Gotcha, and okay. Um, I believe, Paul, um, you also use RIDIS. Do you have that function available that shows the severity of incidents? I do not believe that Michigan has that availability in their subscription to RIDIS. Gotcha. Certainly, RIDIS is um, being used by a pretty good population now. Um, how would you say it helps uh, like the ops room floor? Uh, I know you, know you were showing a lot of reports and bottlenecks, but from an ops room floor perspective, what do you think has the highest value? 
I think the highest value for the ops room floor is um, sort of planning where the most help is needed, as well as um, whenever an incident happens, and let's say that it's a high level incident, sometimes you need all hands on deck, but that doesn't mean that all of the traffic around Georgia stops. Um, having those RITIS notifications set up could notify you and say, hey, while our major priority may be over here, we can get notifications about additional incidents um, that may happen elsewhere so that we don't put all of our priority on one area. Um, in addition, you could also find um, hotspots or you could put this information into Power BI and say, hey, we need more hero um, coverage in this specific area because uh, maybe last month or pre-pandemic, we saw that we needed these specific routes but now due to times changing, um, this is where we need more help. So I think really just getting those efforts focused and um, allocating resources to areas that are needed based on the data, as opposed to um, just kind of what you're seeing in the, um, in the field. I believe that RITUS is that extra set of eyes if you were a spider and you had eight eyes. Very good. That was a corny joke. I get it. So there's going to be actually more um, about, I think, the emerging side of RITUS during the um, training session next week. But I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Catherine, but you could probably replay this tape if you didn't have RITUS today. You could go through and follow Catherine's clicking and link, you know, what, what she did in the software and probably get pretty familiar in the time that you know she went through it, um, if you were to replay the tape, that probably would get you fairly good familiarity so that um, the, the, the session next week would be uh, more valuable to you as well. Definitely. And I would um, like to just give another shout out to the help function um, that we're going to open. So let's say that you did have more information um, that you wanted about the bottleneck ranking. By clicking help, it'll explain what each one of these items are and more specific information. It provides um, things such as the Q length profile, what goes into this base impact, how speed differential total delay is calculated, and really just provides an overview of these items and incidents that are ongoing. So for a more detailed analysis, if you want um, specific, the most specific information, I would say go, go to the RITIS help section. They really have a lot of good, good items and information. Very good. So as a pretty heavy RITIS user, what would you say is the level of learning uh, difficulty uh, for a, a first-time user? I would say for a first-time user, it should be as simple as possible. Um, RITUS is very hands-on and they have a very similar um, outline for a lot of their different areas. You select the route, select the data and submit it. Um, so it's really easy to jump from different areas. Uh, a great thing about RITUS is that it has a lot of various different um, virtual or visual formats that you can look at. So. If you are a first time user and if you're not sure where to start, I would say um, start with the bottlenecks and just kind of play around with it. Um, and it's, it's pretty easy once you get the hang of it to just pick up on it. So there's plenty of, you know, uh, ops floor applications. Um, it seems that there's plenty of just plain old ranking kind of applications, which, you know, that could even be transcending into the planning function or, you know, project development function. Have you um, spent time doing the, the ranking of, of problems or of, um, you know, severity with this tool? I would say that I've um, tried to rank severity as far as the congestion within uh, the bottlenecks go, but I do look forward to, to ranking on different levels. And I'm excited to work with um, different platforms and data to kind of combine those questions. Fantastic. Uh, we have a question. Can RITUS alerts be sent to others outside of your account? Yes, they can. 
if you are um, one person for the office and you want to send alerts or program alerts for all of your, um, let's say, hero employees, then you can set those up. So one person can set them up to send them to, to a variety of, of people. Fantastic. All right, uh, last call for questions in case anything comes through the chat. Um, I think we're close to wrapping this up. Thank you, Catherine, for uh, stepping us through that. And I know it was quick, but that's the best part about having a recording is you can set it at three quarters speed and take your time and, and learn it. Um, so we encourage you to, to use that as an opportunity. Um, I think uh, we have you know, another opportunity next week to talk more about this tool. And, you know, for, for um, us and, you know, anyone in operations, this is a tool that, that comes at, I believe, no cost as long as you're in Georgia. And there were instructions in the uh, previous uh, email blasts in order to, to set up an account. So feel free to take advantage of that. I think we're going to conclude this session then. And I just want to thank the presenters and demonstrators one more time, um, uh, Chrissy, Don, Paul, and Catherine. And um, I know we were going quick, but you're, feel free to reach out um, if you have any need to get in touch with anyone in particular. Happy to follow up if that helps you out in any way. And again, uh, thanks for tuning in for this training session. And until next week, I think we'll uh, sign off. Thanks so much.